Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this session is called Natural Stone Countertops, Considerations for Marble, Granite, Quartzite, and Soapstone. It is one of the Natural Stone Institute CEU presentations. Um, if you are a member, you can uh, go through a, a very simple orientation process and deliver this yourself if you're a stone professional to uh, your, your customer base. Uh, my name is Buddy Antra. I am a fabricator, countertop fa primarily a countertop fabricator in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, a longtime member of the Natural Stone Institute. I've got 40 years in the natural stone industry, mostly as a countertop fabricator. I've served on the board of directors of the Institute since 2016. I'm going to allow the, uh, the rest to introduce themselves so I don't have to. We have a nice diverse panel of uh, different uh, areas of experience. Evan. Also, don't forget the uh, current sitting board president of the board of directors. So wonderful to have you here as well. Uh, my name is Evan Cohen. We're a uh, importer distributor of uh, natural stone and other hard surfaces in uh, Southern California and Arizona. Uh, we do residential, commercial, cut to size, and um, we. I'm also on the board of directors as well, following in uh, Buddy's footsteps, just not as much uh, experience, but uh, glad to be here as well. He's the current sitting secretary. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, William Spontel. Despite my name, I'm from Italy. Sorry about my accent. So I work for a marketing agency, and we work with uh, quarries from Morocco, uh, Portugal, uh, Carrara, Italy, and uh, Tuscany. I've uh, been in the country for 22 years. I've been in the business for uh, 20 in the natural stone. Glad to be here with you. Thanks, Williams. Now, as, as you see, we have a fabricator and installer. We have a, uh, a distributor and a designer. So we've got like the three, you know, main areas about working with natural stone in the home. So, um, and let me just say that if anybody has any questions on anything that we're covering at any time, we only have an hour, but please go ahead and ask now like as that slide is up and as that topic is uh, going on, rather than wait to the end and then we kind of lost track of what we're talking about. So um, I'm gonna just kind of go through all of the other stuff. If you have any questions about this, I talked about the CEU program. Uh, members can become CEU uh, speakers uh, and it's a rather simple process. So, and the three of us had to go through with, you know, a little bit of orientation to, uh, you know, be allowed to do this because we don't want to just run up here all willy nilly and stuff, so. Uh, how many designers in the room? I see one, two, four, yeah. four, okay, all right, good. Any uh, fabricators? Fabricators. Okay, countertop primarily? Okay, distributors, slab sl sellers there. Okay, that's, uh, well, that's half as your group there, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> and how many uh, retailers, like, uh, like storefront, tile, stone stores? Okay, so we have a you know we have a pretty good uh, a pretty good crowd, pretty uh, diverse crowd there. Um, natural stone is beautiful. It's got uh, all kinds of things. No two pieces are the same. Even those salt and pepper granites that we see on the sides of buildings, when you know the the countertop boom went on, and you had a choice of lunar pearl or uh, you know rosa bovino, they looked the same, except one was pink and one was white and gray. Um, your neighbor can get the same thing and it, it still isn't the same. It's not, you know, they're just no two pieces alike. And, uh, you know, we're gonna try to, you know, help you out to, you know, figure out what's gonna be the best for not only yourself, but for more importantly, your end user. And there are the learning objectives. I'm not gonna read it verbatim. You have any questions, I'll leave it up there for a second and, uh, you know, go ahead and ask or I'm just gonna keep on clicking. All right, so let's know what stone we're using. Know your natural stone, okay? Now, we all had uh, earth science back in the day, and, um, you know, it's, uh, we learned some things, but I forgot by the time I uh, was 18 and working on a high-rise building, I forgot everything I learned in high school, which was like a year earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, uh, the difference between natural stone and, man, and the man-made engineered stone is natural stones are uh, what we call harvested. They're basically carved out and 
you know, they're, they're just made from what they are. They're not a bunch of ingredients put together to resemble a stone. So this, this photograph here, I believe, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, that's, uh, that's the local Las Vegas rock quarry of that, uh, the local quartzite that we see a lot around here. And siliceous stones are those based basically on uh, silica or quartz based. Your granites, quartzites, soapstones, they have different qualities as far as scratchability. Uh, they primarily won't etch. You can leave a lemon on it and nothing will happen. Soapstone, you might be able to scratch it with your thumbnail and, you know, the, the, the granites and quartzites, which quartzites I'm going to say are relatively new to the market, you know, 10, 15 years since I started seeing them on a regular basis. Um, and when they came on, they were labeled they were labeled, mislabeled, you know, but geologically, those are, you know, commercially, this is what we're selling. And um, geologically, we'll get into there's some others in that category, you know, that we sell as granite, but it's really a gabbro or other types of geological things. Um, the calcareous stones are marbles and limestones. They will etch, leave a lemon on it, it'll etch, scratch a little bit easier. Who knows the difference between a limestone and a marble? Evan, why don't you answer that? A uh, few billion years? Yeah, at least a couple hundred billion, million years. So, you know, lime, uh, marble is a limestone that was, uh, uh, you know, compressed or, or heated, and it, it gives it a different type of uh, structure to it, but it's the same type of ingredients. And more pictures of stuff. We're talking about absorption here. If you, if you look a little bit, the Danby marble, you think granite is going to be less absorbent than marble, but the Danby marble is... Less, uh, it, it's 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 imper it's more impervious than you know a lot of granites, which is kind of you know it's kind of you know contrary. But what this what this slide tells me and what this information tells me is there really is no blanket statement when we're talking about natural stone. Um, there you can't just say well all granite performs like this or all marble performs like that. It's it, they're really unique to each other and, you know, different from each other and, you know, unique to themselves, I should say. If, if I can add to that as well, it's very important, obviously, some designers here, fabricators, uh, stone distributors, knowing the stone, knowing what you're working with and being able to get that information to the client properly is really important. And, uh, you know, you see these types of things, uh, these slides here, and it just goes to show that there's really no, as you said, uh, blanket statement. So uh, one of the things that I I'd, I'd always like to mention here as well is that if there's questions about using certain types of stones, how it's going to perform, uh, there's a lot of resources out there, uh, whether it's a distributor who uh, understands the stones well, and if it's not, then being able to reach out to either your local, uh, if you're familiar with the Natural Stone Institute has a great resource library, and there's a lot of people you can call that'll pick up the phone, and if you have a question about a specific product, how it's going to last, where you should put it, if it's, you know, the proper ways to handle it, Lots of information there too, because it, it it's it's quite a broad range of what what works. So, I want to get a, a quick idea of experience. Uh, you know, time time in the in the stone industry. How many have been here less than ten years, working with natural stone? Ten to twenty. Twenty and more. Thirty and more. All right. I know I don't look as you know like I've been working with stone for forty years. But, <laughs> forty um, and more. Who's familiar with Crema Marfell? Where's that thirty-year guy? <laughs> well, Crema Marfell way back it was was always sold as a marble. Geologically, it's a limestone, so it's it's particularly softer and more absorbent in general. You know, I don't want to contradict my blanket statement statement. Um, but the creme marfell was sold as a marble because it takes a high shine. There are a lot of limestones on the market that um, commercially they've been sold as marbles because they, they, they take that really, really high, high shine. So, Williams, you want to? Yeah, I want to add something because I come from the Italian region, so it's amazing at, and it's important actually to understand that, you know, there are marbles and marbles. Uh, if you happen to be in Carrara, which is a beautiful, you know, part where the Carrara marble is extracted, you will see a statue outside. People think, oh, I cannot put, you know, marble on exterior. Some marbles actually they can be put outside. They can sustain, you know, the acid rain, they can sustain the meteorological elements. Uh, so, you know, do your research, like we've been talking about, you know, National Stone Institute technical manual is a good resource, but no in details the technical characteristics uh, of the product. Thanks, William. And just, here's, you know, just some more photographs of various marbles or so. Please chime in if you have any questions about anything. Um, 
you know, I, I would have said Imper Imperador Light was a limestone, you know, going back just by the way it performs, but, you know, it's a, geologically it's a marble. Okay, marble or quartzite. How many uh, have uh, purchased a marble and thought it was a quartzite or specced it? How many people have heard of soft quartzites? Okay, so we hear the term soft quartzites all the time, but that's not really a thing. And so it's really important to understand what that is and why. And uh, we hear that term being thrown around uh, out there, and it's just given a false representation of what that product is and how it's really going to last. Yeah, and, and you know, this, this is telling us that your scientific, your geological category, and you have commercial categories. I mentioned that, you know, a lot of the granites that we uh, used are geologically something else. Ingredients are basically the same. Um, a nice, uh, what, what is considered a nice, I know it's spelled Ganace, uh, but it's, uh, remember Santa Cecilia, New Venetian Gold, Jello Venenciano, those are nices, and they perform like granites, but they're actually metamorphic. Um, they were once a granite, and they were just subtly changed by, uh, you know, the tectonic pressure or heat, and I touched on the limestone versus marble thing, the Crema Marfel, Botticino, Rojo Alicante, some of those old, old, uh, you know, I say old, they're all old, but the materials we used a lot back in the, you know, 80s and 90s. All right, the right application. Um, how many are afraid uh, to put marble in the kitchen? And why, why are you afraid of that? Okay. What's that? Okay. Okay, all right. Um, Evan, you want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, we can, <coughs> we can speak to... First, I'm going to let you talk about this one here. Okay, I'm going to go here first, but great, great comments there. Thank you. A lot of good stuff we can talk about. Uh, we do want to talk a little bit about, obviously, natural stone versus artificial stone. Uh, what do they say uh, is the best flatter... The, uh, uh, Imitation. Imitation is the best form of flattery. Is that right? So uh, a lot of people uh, flattering the natural stone industry often... Uh, uh, duplicated and never you know replicated. They can't make it uh, the same way. And so, uh, putting a natural product. I, I, I'm a big fan on this. Just uh, I guess <clears throat> by a show of hands, and I'm going to ask the ladies on this one here. How many of you would prefer to have some cubic zirconium earrings rather than diamonds? I hear crickets. Okay. Yeah, and that that's uh, that I makes sense, giggles. right? Now, now we know that when buying a diamond, for example, there's inclusions, there's flaws, there's, there's all that stuff that we, we know, and you can buy a cubic zirconium without any of that, uh, without any of those issues. But we still prefer the real thing. We still prefer the natural product that has potential characteristics, flaws, any of that. And so, um, realistically, they're perfectly imperfect, and that's what I love about natural stone. Uh, you're seeing here uh, different engineered, and, and what's interesting about this slide here, you see the Mont Blanc, for example. That name gets thrown around, right? It's a popular product, everybody's looking for it, everybody wants it, and all of a sudden, the, the engineered products start to make products and call it the same name and try to sell it the same way. So really understanding when you're asking for a product too, knowing what you're looking for and understanding, you know, is this, is this Mont Blanc a, a quartz? Is this Mont Blanc a quartzite? You know, what, what is this product here? There's also a white glass product called Mont Blanc, and then there are, of course, the fancy, expensive pens. Yeah, I want to make also um, a comment about this, uh, because, you know, coming from Europe, you know, for us, putting marble in a kitchen, it's, you know, something that we are accustomed to. We, we know the expectations. We know that if you put polished marble in a kitchen, over a period of time, it will become whole. Here, I'm surprised, because a lot of, you know, people, they ask me, oh, I'm afraid of putting marble. I like fudge the chocolate thing that is put together. And when I go to the fudge factory, I see a marble countertop, which to me is beautiful, hygienic. Yes, it doesn't look like, you know, when it was put in at the beginning, but uh, it's useful, you know. It does uh, what uh, the expectation was at the beginning. And that's to me, is amazing. Yeah, and I think that goes to <clears throat> the, the talking about the staining or etching. We will go into that a little bit more, but the durability of marble and utilizing it and realistically speaking, you know, we, we buy leather couches and those leather couches don't really feel comfortable until they're broken in. Natural stone, even marbles, are, are living, breathing products. And, you know, to put them in there and to expect it to wear uh, normally, that's, that's part of the beauty and the charm. Um, I mean, I could speak to old stone that I've seen in houses that are maybe 30 or 40 years old. You can speak to stone that you've seen out in uh, Italy and... 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the stone there, I mean, uh, here, 300 years old, it's old. For us, 300 years is like, you know, brand new. So there are churches there that, you know, they are, you know, 2,000 years old. If you think about the, the Roman Empire, they quarried, you know, marble 2,000 years ago in the Carrara region. And the churches are still there, I can assure that. So, uh, so that's the beauty of, you know, working with something natural that comes from hurt, uh, modified by human beings, but at the same time, you know, it's still there. So that's the beauty of the stone. People spend thousands of dollars to travel to see his stone, and I haven't had anybody spend thousands of dollars to see my stone countertop. So clearly there's something in older stone. What's the price of gas in California? <laughs> thousands of dollars a gallon. <laughs> All right, that, you know, this, this little chart, it, you know, it shows you how, how, I'm a fabricator. I get asked, is quartz cheaper than granite? Is granite more expensive than quartz? Is mar marbles more expensive? You know, they, they ask these questions, but, you know, when it comes down to it, their price point, there's high price points for this, there's high, low price points for that, and, um, it, you know, depending what they want to spend, and what I typically, the direction I typically get, give them is, what do you want to look at every morning when you make your coffee? What's important to you? Is it the aesthetics? Is it the durability? Um, is it the carbon footprint? This shows a little bit of the, you know, the little factory emojis or whatever you want to call them there. You know, as far as natural stone is concerned, we cut it out of the mountain, and we're going to get into sustainability a bit. We cut it out of the mountain, we turn it into slabs, we send it to a fabricator or we send it to Evan's place and then to a fabricator. Where the other products, there's a much larger process. There's four or five more steps. There's factory steps, there's chemicals involved. There's all kinds of other things. And I'm, you know, we're not here to bash the other products, just to you know, d dispel the information that they, they, using natural stone is worse for the environment than these man-made products and stuff. And if I can, if I can enlighten, there's, this is, Again, another thing I like to uh, talk about. <clears throat> natural stone, what you see is what you get. The ingredients in natural stone is natural stone. When you talk about a man-made product, whatever that man-made product is, nobody really knows what went into it. Nobody really knows the ingredients, how much was used, if it was the right stuff or not. Uh, some people may have heard me say this in the past, and I'll say it again, but uh, if Buddy and I are here selling uh, chocolate chip cookies today, and I've got my chocolate chip cookies at a, a dollar a cookie, and he's selling three for a dollar, People are going to go buy his naturally because it looks like they're, you know, they're chocolate chip cookies and they're cheaper. Now, ironically, the only reason he was able to make them cheaper was because he was able to use salt, which was cheaper at the time, than sugar. Well, tell me how that chocolate chip cookie is going to taste and how much those are going to sell. The problem is, is with, with a natural stone, you know exactly what's inside of it. There's no surprises. When you're talking about a man-made product, there's a lot of surprises. And I'd hate for that product to be a surprise on my customer or my client. So I do a lot of research to really understand where it comes from, what's in it, and, and help people understand what they're getting, durability, and how important that is. And that also does determine price. So uh, it's really good to understand your products there. Okay. W Williams, you want to talk about this little walkway? Well, I mean, the walkway to me looks like the Via Appia in Roma using cobblestone. And one comment I want to make, you know, the stone age with us. So when he's new, he behaves like a kid. But when he gets older, you know, it has character. It, it brings something that, you know, is aligned with ourselves. So something that, you know, goes end to end uh, with, you know, our age. And, you know, the beauty comes out uh, when it becomes old. Okay, and now I know you're, you're sitting here thinking, says, I thought this was about countertops. Well, chapter one is just about over, okay? <laughs> so we want to get a little prologue going in there. And here's, you know, the, the, the steps it takes to get the natural stone into the home. Here are the steps it, it takes to get the engineered quartz or even centered products into the home, too. So you can see there's quite a bit more that goes into it. And, you know, I've, I'm looking at that one right in the middle that says polyester styrene dyes and other additives that are manufactured. Um, you know, the, the result is, well, it might be something that looks like natural stone. And what did you say a minute ago? Imitation is the best form of flattery. Okay. That's right. So, you know, so the transparency, uh, you know, about the red, you want to tell us what a red list is? I, I leave that for you. I'm not familiar with it. it a, a red list is like an, a, a list of like harmful ingredients. So, you know, some products are supposed to do that. Those of you who have a shop or whatever, you have all those SDMS. Uh, 
you, you know, stat, a notebook full of SDMS sheets about everything, you know, to, in your shop, whether it's uh, the alcohol or the, the, the products that you're manufacturing and the, you know, the, the, all, all the various products you have in there, whether it's the dye for your glue or whatever it might be. And um, it, it, it's just stuff that's harmful. It can't be thrown away properly. It might be caustic. That's, that's a red list. Yeah, even at the end of the cycle, let's say you want to change the stone in the building, the countertops, uh, it's not going to be detrimental you know, to the, uh, the environment. So that's the other thing to consider as well. Some other products, you know, well, they could be. Yeah, when you think about taking your countertop off, uh, I think a lot of people say the average time life cycle of a countertop might be seven to ten years, or at least that's maybe in California. I don't know, but uh, people are changing. You know, they're changing their countertops more frequently. And <clears throat> when you take off a stone and you potentially either recycle it because it can be recycled. As a matter of fact, the roads you drive on, everything underneath the road is all crushed up granite, really crushed up stone. So uh, you can either recycle the product, or even if you throw it in the landfill, you're putting a rock back in the in you know back in the in the uh, yep. in earth there. You take a product that has a lot of chemicals, fillers, other things, and you put those in the landfill. Now, you think about down the road, what's that going to look like down the road? And when we talk about environmentally friendly, one of my best questions is, are we talking about being environmentally friendly for today or for the future of this planet? And I think that that's a big thing, is to put Mother Nature back with Mother Nature if you go that route. You know, the, the NSI has uh, the, the sustainability standard, and right now it's with the, with, with the couriers, and there's uh, roughly, Mark, 30, 25, 30? Yeah, a little over 30 North American quarriers that have achieved this uh, certification, which basically means that they are uh, uh, harvesting the stone, producing it with as little impact on the environment as possible. And even part of that is what's going to happen to the to the property when when the uh, uh, materials are exhausted. Some things that, uh, you know, there's some uh, 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 Adventure Park is one in Connecticut that's an old brownstone quarry. Uh, some places have become golf courses, you know, if it's a type of spread out sort of, uh, you know, quarry. So there has to be a, a, a plan to reuse the, land, reuse the land, water usage, electricity usage, how they go about it. Even transportation is figured into this. And we have 30 uh, North American quarries that have achieved this, and we are getting into more and more environmental stuff, EPDs and things like that, as we're going along, as it is getting more and more important to uh, the decision makers. Now let's talk about fabricating and installate and install installating. Oh boy, and installing care and maintenance. This is this is what we came here for: natural stone countertops. Now we're going to make some countertops. Okay, we figured out how to get them. Now we're going to make them. All right, so you start with working with your fabricator. I believe that's a, uh, it was supposed to be a picture of the Stony Creek quarry because we were going to segue from, but it, it, it appears to be an Italian marble quarry. So that's where it starts. So you see that, you know, nice little thing, the big old blocks, and it just looks like uh, some rocks. But polish them up, and, well, we know what it gets, you know, how they turn up. And then they, you know, cut the blocks down. That's, uh, I don't know where that is, but, you know, this is just all, you know, factory stuff set it up like a loaf of bread, slice it up. It's not that easy, but it's getting polished on the assembly line. Handles, you know, you know, the, the safety and care not to scratch or even break them or anything. And, uh, you know, here they are in uh, Evan's yard maybe, or my yard, but my yard's not that big. But, you know, we talk about safety, and part of safety is, is storing the slabs, um, it, you know, especially when we're, we have the, uh, the homeowners in their house, they might bring their children. Uh, you know, my office, uh, my my office staff is very good about having little coloring books and stuff to keep the children occupied, so they're not going out into my shop and uh, you know touching something they're not supposed to. And I'm not just talking about the slabs; they might get their hands on some of the tools, sharp tools and things like that. You know, so templating. Who? Um, it's everybody. The, the, the fabricators who digitally temp templates. Is there anybody still working with the sticks and the tape measure? I do a little bit of both still. So, you know, it's, uh, as technology is uh, improving, you know, so, so can our uh, efficiencies and stuff. There's a digital layout, you know, done with a, uh, a, a software. I don't know which brand it is, um, but uh, you can see how the photographs of uh, it just re basically picking and choosing where we're going to... Uh, you know, cut, you know, cut the slab. And there's uh, the old-fashioned way. Um, Who's that handsome guy in the picture? 
Oh, uh, well, I don't know. That's a. I think that looks like my younger brother. <laughs> anyway, that's you know the old-fashioned way with the you know put the sticks together and lay it out, and we can give you know the, the the homeowner can actually see. They can do it with the digital. But the thing about the digital, you still don't get that aesthetic feel for the stone you're working with. You know, and that's you know that's my opinion. They can't really touch it and feel it and everything. You know, it's. Yeah, it's efficient, it's convenient. We'll just send you, you know, a, a couple of pictures to your office. You check off on it, we'll cut it that way. But what can happen is you, you cut it that way, your sawyer might get a hold of it and say, hey, there's a, you know, a, a fissure here or something like that, and they have to move it two or three inches. Now you're sending the photographs back and forth, or somebody's not going to sign off on it, and they're not going to be happy with the final product. So, you know, working with uh, the end user is important, setting expectations and you know so on and there's you know nice little shop drawing i rarely have to do that i'm a smaller shop i recently had a job that uh they wanted shop drawings for everything including the small pieces on the shower sh shelves and everything and and um the design team kept sending them back with little red pencil marks and everything and it kind of drove me nuts a little bit and and but anyway it's what they wanted and you know our goal i think all of our goal is to make the end user happy and you know various equipment you know you get the cnc equipment any questions on equipment i want to hear from like you know the design the design folks you have any questions on how this equipment works or anything like that you know feel free to just throw up your hand and uh, mark will get you a microphone maybe it's a water jet machine now today they have saws and water jets combined you know Back in the olden days of like, I don't know, 10 years ago, you had to cut it and then put it on the water jet if they were going to do some water jet stuff. But there's an edge machine for straight polish work. Doesn't help with round, you know, if you got a round uh, a curve or an inside corner, but if you're doing volume work, you can zoom right through with one of those. And we'll get into some finishes, and William's going to talk a little bit about that from the design end. Yeah, from a design point of view, um, Buddy, the beauty of a natural stone, you can recreate uh, uh, texture that, you know, they appear differently according to your style, according to your creativity. On the left here, you see like a polished. So you want to put polish when you want to actually reflect, when you want to make the, you know, the room brighter. Uh, on the, as I mentioned before, through this conversation, is better for marble because it does not reflect and it looks like a little bit hold, or you can have a texture that also has a feeling. The beauty of you know the, the different finishes, they actually feel different when you actually touch them. That's another thing to consider. So they send us different, you know, I would say uh, sensations, uh, and different, and they create different, really different emotion as well. Uh, the other thing that you can see from these pictures, not just countertops, but you can create, you know, designs uh, using the backsplash. We're gonna go into more uh, details later. Uh, anybody doing a lot of outdoor kitchens or more so than you were maybe two or three years ago even? No? No more outdoor kitchens? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, that that uh, the texture, the leather, the brushed gives it like an earthy feel when you put it outside. Gives it like, hey, I found this in the backyard and I put it on my barbecue uh, counter here, you know? So, and it, you know, those, when I brought up the marble in the kitchen, one of the things I do is I, you know, almost insist that it becomes honed in the, uh, they hone it and for different reasons. And we'll touch that a little bit. So that is, you know, for a softer material in the kitchen, uh, you know, honed is a suggestion. And, you know, here we are, you know, installing something here. This is a hotel in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, we're putting a quartzite counter in their little coffee bar there. And uh, you can see we're handling it upright, even though it may appear healthy. You handle it, you know, horizontally. It may not support its own weight in the middle. So, and that's part of the whole safety. And you get into, you know, we want to be into the same, you know, habits. We find stone that's more, that uh, might be more healthy. And well, this one I can carry flat. But then, my crew may decide, well, I carried that one flat. Let me risk it with this one, this one, and this one. And it's not going to work, you know, when, when it gets to a point with a more, more fragile material. Um, you want, uh, we want to make sure that the uh, a path to where we're going with the counter is clear before we pick that, that stone up and carry it inside, whether we're put, putting it on a, a wheel dolly or whatever. So, you know, the safety comes into it and sometimes access. If you're, I, I do a little bit of work in New York City. I go and measure with the digital machine there and um, 
you know, I got to make sure it's going to fit in the elevator because I'm not walking out with a template that might not fit in the elevator. So there, there are a lot of things we have to, uh, you know, take a look at, and that's you know something to you know talk about, no matter what uh, you know part of the industry you're in. And you know more. This this is uh, addressing rotting, which uh, they have other equipment that today, uh, like clamps and things, that we may be able to avoid using rods. Years ago, it was stainless steel rods, which do rust. Okay, don't you know? Just because it's stainless steel, don't think it's not going to rust. They do rust. Um, it takes a while. It, it it all it takes is one little air pocket in the epoxy in front or back of the sink for that drop of moisture to get in. And ten years later, it's oxidized and broken. How many have seen that that left to right, east to west crack in front of the sink? You know, from a, something that was installed 10, 15, 20 years ago. Nobody? Wow. Well, Mark, I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, uh, Evan, this is one of your jobs, I believe. And we, we see the, the, the detail. It's beautiful quartzite. Um, it's talking about finger space, you know, the little space underneath that one inch of overhang there, getting into waterfall details on this one and, the, you know, the full height splash. Um, you know, the, the proper sealing at the joints. Evan, you want to add about this? This is one of your projects, I believe. Uh, this, is, this is our material, actually. It's, a, uh, <clears throat> it's called Deep Blue from, uh, from Brazil. Uh, pretty material there. Um, but really just, uh, you know, so we, we're, I guess, you know, from my perspective, we put some pictures here, but we do work with our fabricators, uh, you know, oftentimes with the materials just to make sure that, you know, they know what they're getting, they can see the materials and help them, uh, you know, get the right products. Um, we, we pay a lot of attention to little details. So, you know, something like this, for example, on that overhang, uh, you know, everybody, you know, well, how many people here are in the 2CM market? Okay, so we have some 2CM and then a lot of 3CM. So in 2CM, we have to deal with, you know, the subtops, the, the, the boards and everything. And so, you know, in, in that area, if you've ever sat at somebody's bar top and you're sitting there and you feel the wood underneath and get a splinter, or it happens to me all the time, I guess that's just my fault. But, um, you know, we focus on really even not just what you see up top, but what's underneath too, making sure you have, you're using a good plywood. We, we actually used a, a, a cabinet grade plywood underneath. Uh, we, we promote that. So that way it's smooth, it's finished, it's nice. Uh, because it's what you see and what you don't see on there. And so the details, uh, you know, really the lines, matching up the lines, a uh, good fabricator that you work with, uh, working with them I think is very important. We always suggest go meet with them, uh, look at where they're going to template it out, see how the lines are going to match up, make sure you're okay with that. Because uh, the last thing you want to do is a, a kitchen like this in your backsplash right behind your sink, you have a line where your pattern changes. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to see that. So having those kinds of conversations so you can have the continuity in the pattern uh, is really important as well. You know, sometimes the budget might come into con, you know, uh, come into play whether they want to purchase an, an extra slab to make the vein match and, and line up. Question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so quick question, guys. Steve, on the overhang, you have that where you knew where that water was. For instance, I'm just curious what your recommendation is on a freestanding island on the overhang without supports. And then the second part of that is when you have the, on that wrap around the sink on that column, when you have supports on both sides. Are you familiar with the Natural Stone Institute DSDM design, the, the design stone dimensional manual, dimensional stone design manual? That is, uh, it's, a, it's the technical Bible, so to speak. We had another uh, present, presenter the other day call it the Bible. It gives you all of those parameters. Uh, with an unsupported overhang on natural stone on 3CM is 10 inches. Consider, but you got to have the, the two to one ratio when you get to that 10 inches. Even if you have 40, 48 inches on the cabinet, you're still not going any more than 10 inches without any support. There, yes, there are some materials that are going to be healthier and do that. However, something like that might have some dry veins and fissures in it that you, you're not going to see. And the last thing we want is someone to hang that high chair. I don't know why they would do that, but they'd hang the high chair on there, put their baby in, and he comes tumbling down with the stone and all, you know. But, um, so there, 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 there is a guide to tell you in different situations. So if, when I have a customer who tells me, I want a 16-inch overhang, I said, okay, tell me about your, your, your support, your corbels, posts. Are you doing anything like that? No, I want it freestanding. I said, well, then you might have to hire somebody else because I'm not doing it. And it doesn't matter whether it's something very healthy like a black absolute or one of those classic salt and pepper granites. 
Yeah, that uh, that uh, DSDM manual. I highly recommend checking out the uh, uh, with the Natural Stone Institute. If you haven't, go visit and see. That book is it's it's thick. It's got so much information. It'll tell you the the proper standards, you know, that have been tested and everything as well. It's just it's phenomenal. It'll it's a cheat sheet for anything you ever want to know about how to properly install it. And and so I'd recommend checking it out. Yes, and my installers have the the the. Just the installation part, it's even in a separate little binder uh, in the truck. So my template guy carries it, so when there are those questions and he's out there you know, measuring, he can say, no, we can't do this with this material, with that. The man-made stuff, you, know, you have to check with the manufacturer's recommendations on that because there's so many different manufacturers on that. And this is about setting expectations too. So, you know, everything's coming full circle here a little bit there. You know, care and maintenance. All right, well, let's talk about a little bit of this here. Tolerances, spans, and cantilevers. You're ahead of your time, sir. <laughs> You're way ahead of us here. That's, so, that's your book right you know, there. Resin impregnation, of what's allowable repair, what's an allowable seam. It's all in the DSD, uh, DSDM there. And that says number eight. We actually have a revised version coming out very, very soon. And instead of the volume, it's going to be uh, labeled with the actual year that it was re revised. So, you know, if I've got in my office uh, volume seven, that might have been done in 2012 or 2008 or something. I couldn't tell you, but um, the, uh, the you know, we, it, it's it's always getting re revised. You know, professionals are always getting together and put, putting their heads together and and you know changing what needs to be changed and you know removing the outdated stuff. Uh, I want to add something about, you know, the National Stone Design Book. Uh, Marmomac, which is the organization uh, like the NSI in Europe, is uh, collaborating now with, you know, the, um, the NSI, and this book is becoming the, probably the standard for the entire world. So it's something that a great job done by the NSI, promoting, you know, all the technical standards by STM and so forth. And as I mentioned, it's becoming like a guideline, not just for the U.S. market and the Canadian market, but worldwide. Something that, you know, it's very important for the industry to promote it in a proper way. Yeah, we're, we're talking about countertops here, but has anybody done any uh, vertical applications in, say, a shower or fireplace or something like that, where you're going up the ceiling? This will give you, you know, the, the, the proper way to anchor those in. If, you know, it's over a certain size, you can't just use thin set. Um, it, you know, they, it needs to be tied into the wall and, you know, different, uh, you know, various different manners you can do it if it's not, you know, addressed by whoever might have made the architectural drawings or so. So, care and maintenance. It's a nice little piece of marble. There's a piece of uh, marble uh, vanity. Uh, Will is going to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, uh, where do we want to put this marble? In this particular case, like in a vanity top, probably in the bathrooms, we're not going to have objects that can easily scratch the surface. Uh, yeah, you can have some soap, uh, but you're not going to have, you know, uh, problems, you know, putting this into this particular area. So, uh, have the, pr the proper expectation to where you're going to put the product, uh, understand how the product will perform. Yeah, we talked about mar we're, we're going to touch, touch more on marble in the kitchen, but the uh, you know the vanities, there there might be some uh, uh, hair products, uh, tooth toothpaste products and stuff that may damage a marble top. So you still have to you know keep a little uh, you know pay a little attention. A fun fun fact on that toothpaste there. Uh, heard this, you know, I don't know if anybody knows, but when you do, you know, who here brushed your teeth this morning? I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, the uh, toothpaste that you use actually to brush your teeth has marble dust in it. Uh, they actually, at the quarries, they keep a lot of that dust. And, you know, I, I, somebody was telling me a story that they went there and they saw piles of this, this dust there. And they said, well, what is this for? And they said, oh, that's actually sold to the toothpaste company. So it's kind of nice. Who here brushed your teeth with calcium carbonate this morning? That's the real, you know, yeah, nice job. Anybody get Aj? The antacid industry uses a lot of marble dust too, so. so. All right, so we, we've gone from, you know, the, uh, the softer, more uh, vulnerable marble to a uh, more durable granite. And where is that granite? Well, that's my personal kitchen buddy. Oh, okay. So I actually, you know, selected the slabs. Um, I, you know, work with the fabricators. Uh, and to me, it's amazing because every morning, this is actually a silver gray granite from Brazil. So every morning I go there, make my Italian espresso and so forth. I discover something new. So it's something unique. So sometimes we have three hours conversation about that veining that uh, I 
you know, believe that it was there, but my daughter says, no, it was not there. So it's like also a point of discussion. It's kind of interesting. So we can talk about, uh, you see on the left, uh, you know, the picture on the, you know, countertop, um, and we created, you know, that island, which is the table. So you can do this kind of coordinations, you know, across, you know, the kitchen, ranging from countertops to islands, you know, to tables and so forth. Even with a basic kind of like a design in terms of, you know, the, um, uh, the side that goes around, uh, you know, the tables as well as the countertop. There's another version. Now, we're going to call that granite commercially, but it really is, oh, I, I'm going to say migmatite or pigmatite. It has some fancy geological name like that, but it's mostly uh, silicious, quartz-based, and it is, you know, durable. It performs like granite. So not to confuse all the consu consumers, geologically it's something else, but you know what? It's granted as far as most of us are concerned. Uh, I do, I do want to kind of answer question we had earlier about using marble in the kitchens as well and you know proper sealers and understanding those types of uh, stones in there um, we we uh, we hear a lot of people say we try to discourage people from using marble in the kitchen and you know we understand that aspect uh, of you know it's going to be a little bit more maintenance or you're going to see more wear and tear uh, a lot of people that I've talked to really love the uh, the fact of having a natural breathing product in their kitchen that uh, that does have that. They, as people have talked about stories. They have stories of oh, I remember when uh, when this happened, and 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 it's really not you know um, a lot of people that I know that have had it. They're not really they they enjoy it. There's actually a, a piece to that. But on the flip side, uh, honing. We talked about honing. You know, marble honed marble countertops is. I think you said you suggest that oftentimes when people are putting a marble in their kitchen. Yeah, the reason the reason why I suggest it is if you've got a polished marble, you want marble in your kitchen. Okay, you have got to have it. You you're going to live with whatever uh, wear and tear. Um, if it's polished, it's going to get scratched. It's going to get etched. We have great protection on it. It still doesn't protect from from the acids and and citrus and and vinegar and and, and stuff like that. So, uh, but. I strongly suggest, if not in, insist, that it's honed. And the reason being, as it does wear, it's not as noticeable. It just really isn't. A polished kitchen, after a couple of years, it's going to look like you're hosting the Olympics with all the rings on it and stuff. The, you know, whereas the honed, you're going to have to get the light the right way to see, you know, to kind of see where everything, you know, where, where the damage is. And as it's honed, you can have, it, it can be brought back up and given what, we call it, you know, in my neighborhood, a, a, a hug and a kiss, where we just kind of hone it back out. If it's something that's really deep, well, maybe not, but just to kind of bring it back to life a little bit. I did a kitchen back in 2007 um, of a family with four growing boys who were like three to 10 years old. And about five years after that, they asked me to come over and take out some of the scratches. And there was this rectangular pink stain. And I asked her, I said, do you want me to pulled us out that, that, that stain, and she said, no, that's where my son spilled Hawaiian punch, put the placemat over it to hide the fact that it happened, and nobody knew about it for several days. So she wanted to leave it there to tell the story of, you know, her family growing up. So, you know, so it's different strokes for different folks. So setting the example, what to expect with that marble kitchen um, is, is, is important. If somebody wants it, I'm going to say in 2007 when I did that kitchen, I had a five-minute conversation with my end user. Today, I've got like a five-page explanation and waiver for them to sign. And, and on, a, on a sealant aspect of it, proper uh, sealers, I think we were talking about staining. Somebody mentioned about staining concerns. Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of different types of sealers out there. Uh, making sure that you're using the proper sealer for the right products. And that's really going to, oftentimes, like at our, our distribution center, we, we do uh, uh, train people on which product to use for which, uh, which material. So, for example, a granite may require one type of sealer. A quartzite may require another. A marble, perhaps another. And using the right sealer makes all the difference. We've had people that are using one sealer as a blanket sealer for everything, and then they come back and say, well, what's going on with my quartzite or what's going on here? Well, you know, not using the right sealer makes a big difference, and so there is a uh, an education aspect to making sure you're using that right. Yeah, I if I if I come across an unfamiliar product in, in in my shop, we'll do a sample of the you know six or eight different products I have, and and but what might work for 48 hours in my shop might not translate over the long period of time. What might be the best product for that short period of time? might wear out after a year rather than five years. So really, there is no blanket statement again. So, but those are, you know, things to consider there. I know there are some uh, anti-etch coatings coming on the market yet. Um, I have, 
yet to really work with them to find out how effective they are. Uh, so that's, you know, more will be revealed on that. I want to add something on the seal because I do maintain my granite, you know, low maintenance, but you really don't need uh, every day to seal it, you know, really it's once a year. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, an operation that can be done, you know, by the end user in what, 10 minutes, even less than that. So it's not something that requires, you know, machineries, equipment, uh, something very easy to do that we can all do. Just follow the instructions. Yeah. I, I tell them to look for when something absorbs immediately, not 30, 60 minutes later. As you're doing your dishes, you get some splashing and stuff. If those dots happen right away, then it's time to put another application. Yeah, and I, I do recommend, I mean, there are sealers out there that, uh, are 15 year sealers, or they call them lifetime sealers as well, that you can put in there. And as you see here, impregnators versus topical, that's, that's an interesting concept, because people used to have, <clears throat> oftentimes they'd go around and say, oh, you have to seal your counter every six months, every year, and that's pretty common. Actually, more porous products you may want to be looking at sealing more frequently. Um, but there are sealers out there that are 15 year sealers. You put it on one time, and, and it's as easy as windexing, cleaning, wiping it on, wiping it off, and it makes a big difference. And the difference between an impregnator, as you see here, versus a topical product is the impregnator actually gets inside the stone. So when you're washing it, you're not taking that sealer off. The topical coating, when you're washing it and using anything to clean it, you are slowly removing that sealer. So that's where you went from a topical, which would get worn out in a year, six months, and you have to go back and redo it, to an impregnator that actually gets deep inside there and, and molecularly bonds to the stone. So a lot of people come into our place and say, oh, we don't want stone because you have to seal it every six months or a year. And we show them our sealer and say, this is a 15-year sealer. And they just put 15 years on there because realistically, you don't have to put it on even really a second time. I know in our house, uh, I'm trying to remove my granite countertops. I'm trying to ruin them as much as I can because they're old. And, uh, but uh, I, can't, I can't stain them. I can't do any of that. So it's, uh, yes? Well, so, some of these places, uh, and I know zero, they, they will say if you use a sealer that it can actually void the warranty. Uh, so you want to make sure you look into those brands, for example, that are doing that. Um, on the flip side, if it doesn't affect the warranty, it's never a bad idea to, you know, to use a product once, a good product, right, one time, and, you know, set it and forget it, right? Seal it and forget it. But, uh, but I would check with the, the brands because oftentimes they will have a statement in their warranty that says, if you use a sealer, if you do this, then it voids their warranty. Think of the topical coating as a varnish that's going to wear as you drag things on it. A lot of stone that is uh, uh, installed with a cementitious adhesive, like in a shower or something that's thin setted, the, the varnish will prevent that mortar from breathing and the moisture to kind of vapor through, which is a, it, it's, it's a, it's a lifetime process. It's, you know, even though everything seems dry, there's still, you know, slight bits of moisture coming through. So you really can't trap it in. It might end up popping, you know, or, or you know, uh, ca causing it to fail. Okay. Acids. All right, we. Question back here. Are you going to use oh. it dirtier about different feeders for like a quartzite or a granite or a marble as opposed to a one, one size fits all? How, what do you look for to see which one may be preferable or good for a particular stone? Is that the procedure manufacturer or is the NSI have something on that? Or? Well, we, the, the NSI is not going to endorse one company over another. Uh, very, the, there's probably four or five chemical companies that provide great products. As I mentioned earlier, if I have something that I'm unfamiliar with, I would try the water base, the solvent base, the enhancer, and various parts of the stone of the various products to see which one is going to be more effective over the short period of time. And then I would talk you know, with the end user about, um, you know, this worked great over 48 hours, but I'd also tell them that it might translate, not translate to be the best over six years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, my basic rule of thumb is if it's a very dense stone, like, um, you know, some quartzites are very dense, some aren't. But if it's very dense, I will use a solvent based. If it's porous, like a limestone or some of these absorbent quartzites, I'm going to use a water based. And, you know, the difference is, is the sealing molecules are carried. The water is a carrier, the solvent's a carrier. Solvent base is going to be thinner. It's going to absorb into the tighter, denser uh, materials, leaving behind the, uh, the, the polymer molecules that do the sealing. I believe it's polymer. Um, and whereas with something uh, more absorbent like a limestone, the water has got bigger molecules and it's going to absorb into it. Um, and, and 
it, it, and you know, as a carrier, and then leave behind the sealing the sealing molecules. Also, I've I've had a lot of luck reaching out to the sealer companies and asking them. And believe it or not, they've done a lot of testing on specific products. So if I say uh, I'm looking for a Taj Mahal, the best sealer, what do you recommend? A Mont Blanc, what's the best sealer? Uh, and they'll tell me, oh, you should use this one. You should do two of applications, one application. We've gone through that before. And there's certain stones that are super porous that they said do four applications on it. So they, they have a, they've done a lot of research on it. That's who I'd reach out to. I found that if I put a solvent-based sealer on a stone and try to put a water, water base on top of it, that if the sealer's working, it's not going to allow that second application in. But a solvent will probably cut, you know, uh, dissolve through any water-based sealer or solvent-based sealer that's already been applied. So now, none of those are going to uh, prevent from etching. You know, you leave a lemon on there, the acid is still going to do what acid does, and that's eat things. And it likes to eat calcium carbonate. So etching versus staining. Um, There's your Audi the logo. Uh, you know, on the left is an etch that's on a uh, you know, piece of marble. On the right, it's a stain. We can see that the granite has had some rings absorb into it. Now, those will dry out. They could be pul poulticed out. The etching needs to be re-honed re or polished, you know, re uh, refinished. There's, see what the lemon does? And that's, that'll do that in about a second. I just did an inspection where someone was sold a quote-unquote quartzite, but it really was a marble when I saw it at first look. And I actually filmed it as part of the arbitration to... I filmed drop, doing the drip of uh, uh, lemon on there. Squeeze the lemon, let it drop, cleaned it off seconds later, and it looked just like that. So, and you know, some stones are going to be more more vulnerable than others, etch quicker. Uh, you know, the dolomitic marbles might take a little bit more time with a lemon sitting on it than uh, calcareous marble. Everyday cleaning, you want to use safe products, mostly water. You know, if you can use water, use water. If you use a little bit of soap, that's fine. You know, something mild. You don't, you know, get into like, uh, you know, some of the quote unquote uh, natural products might have some sort of citrus in there, citric acid in there for, for, for cleaning, you know. Um, so, uh, accredited fabricators. We talked about cert cert certifications of the quarriers before. We have a certification uh, program for fabricators. They go through a rigorous checklist of not only safety, but just best practices and stuff. And you can look that up on the NSI website to find an accredited fabricator in your neighborhood. And, um, you know, so this way they are more, I'm not going to say they are more knowledgeable, but they have proven to be more knowledgeable. There could be, there are fabricators out there that have the same experience and knowledge, but they just haven't gone through to, you know, to go through that process. But this way you know that that fa fabricator has been through that process and has a proper experience. So um, let's talk about design. We have some designers in here. We have a few minutes left, so we're going to try to quicken it up. But um, which one of yours is that? Well, that's actually an Igen Blue Quartzite, and so uh, when we go into the design trends, obviously a lot of designers here, you're seeing now a lot of colors coming into the market. If you guys have gone through the Brazilian Pavilion, greens, blues, beautiful, beautiful, vibrant colors that are really impactful. We're also seeing that uh, used on the backsplashes. So now it's not just about that black and white kitchen. I think that's, that's kind of in the past a little bit getting a little bit warmer and then you're getting people that are saying, well, I want something that's really going to pop. I want to make a statement. And, uh, and now there's all these beautiful, beautiful stones coming out that, uh, that just have some amazing colors. If you haven't seen them over there in Brazil, go check them out. There's some gorgeous stuff. And with the waterfall design there, that's, you know, something that was very rare 10 years ago and now it's, it's almost commonplace. So. Yeah, this is an interesting project. Uh, the, what you see over here is during the fabrications, pretty much for a kitchen. You know, you have on the left, you have the uh, countertop. On the other, you have, you know, separated island. Uh, you can move to the next uh, photo. So this is the installation. Um, the product here is called the Rosso Colle Mandina. It's a, a marble coming from the Lucca region in Tuscany on the west coast of Italy. Uh, the beauty of this project, you know, the house was an existing home that needed to be renovated. So they selected this product in order to give this kind of like uh, antique look. As you can see, these kind of veins, uh, they are kind of like, you know, large, so they're not, you know, complex, articulated. On the right, uh, you see that uh, island that gives you this kind of like, you know, old look to an entire kitchen. The beauty of this project is that not just the countertop uh, as well as the, uh, the island have been fabricated and using the Rosso Cole Mandina, but also the, the sink. You mentioned before, buddy, that you know you could have problems, you know, in uh, 
oxidizing of you know, metal. In this particular case, they took a small block, uh, they carved it, and uh, with, in the front of that uh, uh, sink, you actually see a piece that has been uh, hand carved by hand uh, in order to create this uh, antique look in this kitchen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, here, if you want to be more modern, yes, go with the, the, um, the Bianco Carrara. So what did they did in this particular case? Can you put polish? We say no, but they did it on the, uh, on the backsplash. You yeah. know? So many times you can actually put on the, on the countertop, but go with the polished you know, um, mosaics, for example, on the backsplash. So they're not affected by that. On the other side of the spectrum, if you want to switch the colors, here you have a uba tuba, you know, the granite, low maintenance. So you can create a you know, different uh, contemporary kitchen by just switching the colors. And so we've gone from the, uh, the classic look with the, with the, ro with the rojo and the, uh, you know, to the you know, contemporary uh, almost lacquer look. So this is, this is one I did a few years ago. It's a calicutta with a... Uh, a polished calicutta. They insisted. I actually had to go back there and poultice out some uh, sharpie characters from homework that the children did at the island. Um, but that you know, this one was fun. So there, there's your uh, the one on the right is a quartzite kitchen. Don't really have a good. I got that picture from the builder, so I don't really have a a, uh, a good view of it. However, you know, you see the you know from the marble to the quartzite gives you the durability. You can get some lighter colors with quartzites um, if you're you know if you're concerned about uh, uh, wear and maintenance. And here is a calicutta in a honed version. Um, you know, vein matched uh, just about everywhere we can. Of course, sometimes, you know, the material yield would give you limitations. The hood was uh, engineered with the, with the homeowner who happens to be an engineer and architect, but that was engineered um, and to an iron frame that is bolted into the, the, the frame of the house. So we, you know, worked together to engineer that as there were really no drawings to get that up there. We referred to the design manual on making some anchors to get it to the uh, tube iron uh, frame, and then they inserted the, the fan apparatus into there, and, you know, the island is butterflied, I mean, butterflied and waterfalled, but, you know, what we, you know, everybody's seen a waterfall these days, so I didn't think that was that, that important. So, and here's another Calicutta Island and uh, full height backsplash, it's hard to see, that was, you know, from the magazine company there that took that picture, and, you know, you can do more than countertops, too. That's, uh, uh, that's a Grigio, a Maybe Verona. I don't remember what the, what suffix is on there, but um, it was uh, you know a, you know di diamond diamond match to you know butterfly diamond match, whatever you want to call it. The hearth, as you see on the bottom, that was almost by accident that it came out that way with the vein matching. It, that just happened to be what was left from the remnants to make that hearth. So I got lucky with that. But that was a fun project. We had to build a wooden platform to get everything up, as we couldn't bring any really heavy equipment into the the house as it is on a second floor. Yeah, these are, uh, this is some of the stone you're going to see if you go to the Brazilian pavilion. You'll see these gorgeous uh, bright colors, uh, these book matches, uh, really, really pretty, aesthetically pleasing to the eye when you see that, uh, that mirror image. And uh, I'll tell you, it just makes you want to go take a bath. I know I do right now. <laughs> well, as you as you could just see, up you know where I live in Connecticut, everything's still kind of traditional with the uh, you know the calicuttas and the, the 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 simpler stuff. In Italy, we have the whole you know variety of things from really really classic and 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 to you know contemporary. And in California, they're still playing with the tie dye. I see. <laughs> so um, those of you who want to become speakers, go to our website, follow the bouncing ball, and uh, and uh, you know get yourself you know, through the orientation. For those of you who want a speaker, a design professional, you know, go to our website. You can find somebody in your neighborhood that can come and give you a presentation and deliver those CEUs. If you have a, uh, there was a couple of retail, uh, uh, you know, guests here. If you want to hold, have a presentation and invite your, your customer base or possible customer base, and you want to have one of these CEUs, you, you know, you can go and find them. And there's, 18 turnkey CEUs on natural stone that uh, uh, our, our, our speakers are trained to, um, to basically deliver. I can't deliver, I, I don't know all of the 18 of them, but there are five or six that I've delivered a few times, presented a few times, and I know pretty well. So, um, website is there, so, uh, and Building Stone Magazine has some great information in it. It's basically, uh, it's focused towards the uh, uh, design community. 
Um, a lot of, you know, bigger commercial products in there. Um, and, you know, we will sell you advertising if you want. <laughs> so, and uh, if you have any questions, Evan, myself, Will, will be at the booth 529 for a little bit after this. Um, you know, give us about 30 minutes to get out there. Uh, also want to mention that uh, our, our Pinnacle Awards, which are the uh, best in the industry, best stone projects in the industry, uh, this year we have a new category, uh, kitchen and bath. And let me just, it, so your best countertop, your best bathroom, and it doesn't have to be slab material. You can have a combination of, uh, you know, a herringbone tile and mosaic with your slab vanity and stuff. Um, and I, how the jury works on these, it's not one winner per category. They decide whether the uh, project is award worthy. So, you know, there's commercial uh, categories, there's parks and monuments, there's about, I think, six or eight different categories. It's not the winner in each category. There may be four winners in one category and zero in another. So if you have something, please enter it. It's, you know, it's, it's a great way to get recognized because all the, all the publicity that comes with it. And, and in, in, in closing, I do want to say this. Uh, <laughs> natural stone, countertops, all of this is a very... Uh, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of things, a lot of unknown, a lot of education that needs to happen. And, you know, coming here is the first step of really learning some new things. Hopefully you all got a couple nuggets to take home with you, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we're not here to answer any questions down the road. Natural Stone Institute's at the booth today, but they're also always around, ready to pick up that phone and help with any questions that we can, because there's a lot of myths out there, and, and they are myths. And so really being able to understand what's real, what's not real, it's great to ask people who have that uh, education, that understanding. So, yeah. Got a question in the back? Will you share your presentation slides? Yeah. Uh, Mark, this is, is this recorded for future on demand, or...? We can get your uh, your information in. Uh... Yep. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's going to be yeah. You can get this presentation through the coverings website. So, and we also have similar web webinars that you can get on demand on on our website. Um, the also what you know uh, Evan was talking about getting information. The gentleman who asked about the span question and the overhang question. Those are the types of answers you can email us and our technical director, or we have a nice technical staff. One of them's in the room with us right now. Will you know get back to you and help you out with that, or direct you to where it is so you can download that and show it to the to show it to your customer. Any other questions? Yes. So you're asking about putting hot stuff on quartzite. Uh, good question. Um, when you're talking about the, the natural, you know, quartzite versus quartzite on, a, on the man-made quartz, you don't want to put hot stuff on it. Uh, natural stone, it can, it can handle the heat typically better, but they always recommend to put a trivet or something underneath it, not directly on there. A lot of that has to go to, I think, even fabrication perspectives in terms of how a crack can happen, how the, the thermal, uh, thermal shock can happen there. So, I mean, I think you have certain... Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the other thing about putting your, your pots, whether they're hot or not, you, these pots and pans today are made from all these different metal, metal alloys. And if you drag one, that metal might, it might be a, material, a, a mineral bonding, so you might get that silver scratch, which is actually a bonding of the, the minerals to your stone. The other thing is some quartzites, you know, not all quartzites are made equally. You have the quartzites like the macabus and stuff, which are relatively solid. They almost look like a, a, a grayish Carrera sometimes. And then you have the Taj Mahals, which are made up of a bunch of micro fissures and, and stuff. You put that hot pot in there, some of those minerals might be a little bit susceptible to you know, to, to the heat. Um, and, and the other thing is the resining practice that's, that's done by the slab yards to fill in those fissures and, and whatnot, that might be affected by your hot pot too. Also, sealers. Sealers aren't meant to withstand heat. That wasn't what they were built, built for. So if you're putting a hot stuff on a sealer, a sealed countertop, that sealer can break down faster, causing you to have to reseal it more frequently as well. Any sealers, they're not meant for the heat. So there's a possibility that too much heat on an impregnator or a topical could actually break it down. So we just recommend, uh, obviously, it's always better to put something underneath it to yeah. be safe. If you have to take it off in an emergency, by all means, do it. But, you know, the dragging might transfer, you know, give you that little scratch thing. The heat might affect a different mineral in it. Um, 
and you know, again, the the resining process that's done in the slab yards, you might get a scorch out of that too. Um, phone number, website, feel free, feel free to tap any any of us on, on the shoulder if you have any questions. And thank you for coming. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all.